Welcome for the third and final afternoon of the Grand Rounds presentations. We'll have two presentations today. The first one is with Michelle Dixon, and then the final one will be with Eric Torres. So not to waste any time, we'll start up with Michelle Dixon on her Grand Rounds presentation. So for some general information about Joe, he's a 33-year-old male, and he had an admitting diagnosis of a displaced intertrochanteric fracture of the right hip. And it was during the 4th of July where he was playing Frisbee in wet grass where he fell, um, slipped and fell. And he's being treated in the acute care setting. Um, a little social history. He lives alone, he's single, and he lives in a two-story home with 12 steps to the second floor. Uh, he works as a pharmaceutical sales rep. He's a college grad. Um, he does have extended family living in the area. He's pretty active and works out at a gym. He's, he's socially active in the community. He's a non-smoker, doesn't drink, and prior to this admission, he had ambulated without, um, without a device, normal distances. Um, Joe was born 12 weeks premature, and I will touch on some of these later as we go. He was born um, with a PDA, which we'll cover later. He developed pulmonary hypertension. He had a heart-lung transplant 12 years ago. Um, he currently has hypertension, renal insufficiency, chronic kidney disease, chronic steroid use secondary to the organ transplant. Um, a PDA is, is quite common in premature infants, and it's, it's a hole, and I'll just show you in the, between the aorta and the pulmonary artery right here. And in the normal infant, after they take their first breath, it closes up, and then you just have this little ligament thing right here. Um, oftentimes, in the premature infant, it doesn't close and then it's called Peyton. Um, smaller PDAs, usually they monitor them and they resolve themselves within hours. Larger PDAs need to be treated and oftentimes they're treated with medicines, catheters, or surgery. Um, when they're untreated, they lead to pulmonary hypertension. And in any kind of congenital heart defect, a lot of times they just refer to it as Eismenger's syndrome which means that you get help, you eventually develop pulmonary hypertension um, because of untreated congenital heart defects. Um, so pulmonary, definition of pulmonary hypertension is it exists um, when the, the pressure is 25 millimeters of mercury at rest and greater than 30 during exertion. For a normal person, it would be 14 millimeters of mercury. Um, some changes that may occur when someone develops pulmonary hypertension is the arteries themselves start to narrow, the muscles tighten in the walls, and they thicken, and then blood clots form, and eventually they're usually candidates for heart transplant. Um, like any muscle, the, the heart, when it has to work harder against resistance, it hypertrophies, and this, lead, this can lead to heart failure on the right side in this case because, as you can see over here, this is the right ventricle which pumps into the pulmonary artery, and if it's pumping against pressure, this side is the one that's going to get larger. Um, some signs and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension are shortness of breath, fatigue, dizziness. These are all things that I might look for. Cyanosis is common a racing pulse, and in his case, this could reoccur even after he had the, um, the transplant. Um, pulmonary hypertension can be treated with medications initially, and it can also, if there's an underlying disease they find that's causing it, they could also treat that disease. But if it's primary pulmonary hypertension, um, a lot of times surgery is indicated. 
Um, this I just threw in here for kind of FYI. This is Dr. Bruce Reitz, and he was responsible for the her first heart lung transplant. And um, prior to this, they tried to do it, but it wasn't possible because they didn't have immunosuppressive drugs. And in this case, they used cyclosporine to prevent rejection. And this was done at Stanford, and I just wanted to show you how pretty Stanford is. I wasn't at Stanford that summer. I was at Mercy Hospital in Scranton. <laughs> But it's, it looks quite lovely. Um, so for the heart-lung transplant, um, his heart-lung transplant would have been in 19, approximately 1994. Um, some inclusion criteria is basically you're at the end stage. It doesn't really matter what causes it, but if you're at end stage pulmonary disease and advanced cardiac disease, you're a candidate. And the recovery period is approximately six months. Um, approximately 39% of all heart-lung transplants are people who were born with congenital heart defects. So some indications in his case was irre irreparable cardiac defect, which I highlighted, or congenital heart disease. Um, acutely the risks of heart transplant include rejection. And then longer term, it's the use of immunosuppressive drugs and integumentary compromise, which I'll get into. Um, acute rejection is usually treatable by an increase in the amount of immunosuppressive drugs they're giving the person. But chronic rejection is usually very bad, um, and it can lead to death if, it's not, if the person doesn't get a, another transplant. So um, some complications related to organ transplant would be, in, in his case, he has osteoporosis because of his transplant. He has hypertension. He has renal dysfunction. And infection is definitely something you want to watch out for because that's a leading cause of death for this population. Um, and then there's some of the other ones, but they weren't pertinent to my patient. So integumentary com compromise is um, important since we do see a lot of skin when we're treating these patients. So it's a good time to take a look at some of these things. Um, the use of these immunosuppressive drugs leads to skin breakdown and also the skin heals more, more slowly. And the risk of skin cancer increases because these drugs also cause photosensitivity of the skin. So anywhere the skin is showing to the sun is a, a place you want to check in this population. Um, some research with this, with osteoporosis in this population is that pa patients who receive lung transplants typically have a really um, acute decrease. It's, it's really drastic in bone density. So they specifically looked at lung transplant recipients. And incidentally, all organ recipients will have bone loss, but lung more than others. So they use this population. And um, the research states that if you use a drug like actinol, it increases bone density significantly in, compared to a group that didn't receive the drug. And in another study where they used biphosphonate um, plus mechanical loading, like weight bearing and such, um, these, the bone mineral density increased by 10.8% as compared to a loss of 14.1% in the control group who received no treatment. So that's pretty substantial and in some of these patients um, we might be able to prevent some of this osteoporosis and subsequent fracture. Um, in transplant outcomes I just wanted to show you what kind of odds that this guy had stacked against him. And in studies of patients surviving greater than 10 years, um, longevity was acuted to delayed development of bronchiolitis obliterans. And that is a viral infection of the lungs that causes an inflammation. Um, that's a leading cause of death in this population. And um, in the second study at Duke University, they found that graft dysfunction in heart recipients and infection in lung recipients were the leading causes of death. So 
with that we have this graph and this graph just shows you here's about where he was he's at 12 years post transplant so he'd be about here which I estimated to be in the 25th I guess 25th percentile um, for surviving and you could see it's a steep decline and as you get out 20 years you're you're really only in a very small percentage of people who are surviving with um, heart lung transplants so another study um, looked at what kinds of things really distress these people this was a survey and muscle weakness is a problem and that's going to be a problem for me because obviously um, that's what we're working with shortness of breath with exertion and changed appearance changed appearance is usually caused by the steroids and they might get a round face they might have abnormal hair growth and those kinds of things obviously um, bother people cosmetically this is just an overview I just wanted to kind of review here now so um, Joe was born with a PDA he was born prematurely developed pulmonary hypertension causing an enlargement of the right side of his heart this led to a oh and also that that leads to lung damage which is why the heart lung transplant so these two things lead to the heart lung transplant which then caused his osteoporosis and renal failure which hasn't been too much of an issue for him at this point it's just a um, blood test can ascertain whether you're, you're in renal failure he doesn't really have any symptoms as yet the osteoporosis then led to his hip fracture which is why I'm seeing him but I also have to be aware of the immunosuppressive the compromises there so just to kind of review um, some hip fractures this is all hip fractures I'm just comparing to his was an intertrochanteric fracture um, also femoral neck fractures are common but this is what he had and it's extra capsular and occurs between the greater and lesser trochanters um, this would be the surgical decision tree used by the physician when some a patient like this comes in um, he might look at the type of the of the hip fracture we just talked about intertrochanteric so that would be the first thing you look at whether it was capsular extra capsular or inside the capsule um, what his preferences are what kind of surgeries he likes to do or what he's best at um, the severity of the injury the age of the patient and in this case of our patient um, comorbid conditions and the prognosis for recovery um, some surgical treatments that might be considered are the compression hip screw and the intermedullary nail this is done by an open reduction internal fixation or an ORIF as we commonly refer to it um, there are others but these are the two most common types that are used in this type of fracture um, first the compression hip screw is used and it's, it's kind of put on the outside of the bone there's a screw that goes up into the neck of the femur and a plate and it, and it holds everything nicely into place um, the intermedullary nail is more like a hip replacement where it goes down into the bone marrow and then a screw goes through it and the neck of the femur and holds everything into place this is a little bit more of an aggressive surgery um, there are pros and cons to both and that both can cause shortening of the affected limb um, the intermedullary nail is used for um, usually for more unstable fractures or fractures that are more in pieces several pieces um, but the intermedullary nail can migrate medially and that causes a lot of pain So one study I looked at compared results between a dynamic screw plate and the gamma nail and found that everybody in both groups healed well 90 percent and except for the gamma nail group had a significant difference in shortening of the, of the affected limb on this patient an ORIF was performed um, with a posterior lateral surgical approach I spoke to the physician who preferred not to be listed his name so I, I just kind of will tell you what he what he told me and that was that this was a fairly stable fracture 
and um, it was clean. It was kind of a clean break between the greater and lesser trochanter to his memory, and um, because there was no blood supply. If it were inside the capsule, you might have had to consider a total hip replacement for this patient, but because it was um, not affecting the blood supply, um, he was a good candidate um, for the compression hip screw. And also this physician had said that this is an easier surgery, it's less invasive. You don't want to take this person through the mill um, in surgery if you can do it more easily with this, this type of a, an approach. So this just shows you what a posterior approach is as compared to an anterior approach. Posterior approach is they kind of have the person laying on their side. I've seen, and I, if you get the chance to see a surgery when you're on your rotations, do. It's wonderful. It's great. It teaches you a lot about what the patient goes through. Um, but typically the patient's on their side with their foot kind of in traction and they, they go in from the back right here where the red line is. Um, some of the medications that this, I'm just going to go over some of these and touch on the uses. A lot of them are immunosuppressive. So Prograf is a drug that is particularly for heart lung transplant rejection to prevent it. And it causes, among other things, weakness, which is something I'm going to be concerned about. Um, Imuran is also an immunosuppressive agent for organ, to prevent rejection of organ transplants, and it causes GI distress and muscle wasting, again, which could cause a problem. Almost all these drugs cause GI distress, which amazingly, this patient um, didn't experience. Um, glucocorticoids is a big one used for organ transplants. It's an immunosuppressive and an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, it causes a lot of problems with soft tissue, breakdown of muscle, bone, skin, and other tissues, hypertension, increased chance of infection, all of which I'm going to have to watch out for with this patient. Um, Nexium is used to treat the GERD that he has, and it doesn't have a lot of side effects, um, really, to speak of. Sporinox is an antifungal agent because there can often be um, lung infections. Um, caused by a fungus that will that could lead to death in this population. So here we want to watch for hypertension, GI disturbance, and dizziness. Um, Benacare is a heart drug used to treat hypertension, and dizziness is a factor here as well. Lovenox is um, a blood thinner that they use after surgery to prevent DVT. It can cause confusion. And cefazolin is, these are some things you had by IV, is an antibacterial used after uh, surgery as a prophylaxis so that this guy doesn't, he really can't afford to get any kind of infection at all. Um, for his pain control, they used um, morphine, which is a, a strong pain control me mechanism. It, it's for severe pain, and it causes sedation, drowsiness, euphoria, respiratory depression. He definitely experienced euphoria. Um, he was up and ready to go when I saw him the first day. Um, Darvacet is what they eventually put him on after he went off of the IV morphine, and that causes sedation, drowsiness, um, respiratory depression, weakness, and dizziness. Okay, so the big question here is why would this type of, why would a 33 year old have this type of a fracture? Normally, if you fell in the grass, you would not break a bone and break your hip like from, from um, just your body weight. Um, and intratrochanteric hip fractures are the most common type of fracture among the elderly. But this Joe is 33 years old, and basically it was caused by his osteoporosis. Um, from his heart lung transplant, from his long term steroid use. Um, in, in, order to, in order to prevent organ rejection early on, they use glucocorticoids, which are steroids, um, in very high doses right after the transplant to reduce the acute rejection. Um, this drastically reduces bone mineral density during that time period. 
And if you can see here, this is the normal trabeculation and this is abnormal. And the point between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter is a point that receives a lot of force during weight bearing. So it's a perfect spot for if you have weakness there, it's, it's going to be the spot that's going to give. Um, so just to summarize the glucocorticoids and what they do to the body, um, this diagram il illustrates the catabolic effect of glucocorticoids. So you have decreased bone formation, decreased mass, decreased quality of the bone that's being laid down. Um, you also have muscle weakness, and you have an increased risk of falls, which all lead to the subsequent fracture. So for this patient, um, with regard to osteoporosis, we need to promote a gradual weight bearing over time. Um, this is a patient that's not going to be able to bear a lot of weight on the affected leg. Um, you need to educate the patient and his family concerning safety because he can't afford to have another fall. As far as his compromised immune system goes, um, hand washing is important before and after you treat this patient for everybody, not just the physical therapist. Um, Heart-lung transplantation causes decreased exercise capacity and pulmonary function. However, cardiac meds can mask um, the vital signs. So some of the things you need to consider are to monitor vital signs at baseline, um, during exertion, and during recovery after the resting. Another thing is to um, monitor their diastolic blood pressure. It should not increase more than 10 to 15 mil millimeters of mercury when they're exercising. Also the use of the Borg scale. Um, because he's taking the Benacare, his, his heart rate is going to be a little bit lower than what it, what it really would be if he had not been taking the medication. So. In these, this population, the Borg scale is used, and it's a, for those of you not familiar with it, it's, it's a visual analog scale, and you ask the person, where about on this scale, zero to 20, do you feel, you know, you're working at? And with this population, you don't really want to go beyond 13, because that's where um, evidence shows that it's, it becomes anaerobic. Another problem with um, organ transplants is loss of the vagal nerve innervation, which can cause, um, Hypotension. You need to use an increased warm-up period and an a increased cool-down period because they're not able to adapt as easily um, without, without the innervation. Um, monitoring ven ventilation status is important. You want to keep this population at exercise between 30 and 35 breaths per minute, and their saturated oxygen needs to be above 90%. So this is a person you'd want to put the pulse ox on their finger while you're um, ambulating them or anything like that. Um, the physician's orders that were in the chart for us were um, physical therapy, evaluate and treat, and he had a toe-touch weight-bearing status on the right lower extremity, and he wanted to start PT the same day of the surgery. So this patient received surgery in the morning, and we were seeing him that afternoon. So um, one study by Kamal and colleagues um, looked at the typical time for ambulation when these patients were in the hospital over a three-year period. And the average time was two days plus or minus 1.5. The significance is, is that the longer they waited to ambulate the patient, the more of an increase there was in the onset of delirium, pneumonia, and increased hospital stay. For this patient, because of his compromised immune system, you don't want pneumonia and you don't want an increased hospital stay. The goal for this patient was to get him home as soon as possible. And I, I would like to think that's why the doctor chose to ambulate him so quickly. Um, and the physical therapy practice patterns, I chose, I chose two in this case because one really didn't cover it all. And the first is for eye, impaired joint mobility, motor function, and muscle performance and range of motion associated with bony or soft tissue 
surgery. And the second is 6D, impaired aerobic capacity endurance associated with cardiovascular pump dysfunction or failure. Um, with this patient, we did look at, we did a systems review and just as part of the history um, to see whereabouts he was in terms of a baseline cardiopulmonary. Um, we looked at his skin, there were no issues. We also checked his incision, which looked like it was, it was healing nicely, it was closed nicely. Um, musculoskeletal and neuromuscular, we did an upper quarter and lower quarter screen. And for communication, he was alert and oriented times three and in good spirits, but he had very poor safety awareness, which I attributed to the fact that, again, we're seeing him the same day of surgery and he's on IV morphine. He doesn't really have great judgment. Um, for the examination, everything was normal except for the hip on the side of the surgery where he had four out of five for uh, flexion extension, abduction, adduction because of the pain. Um, okay, Dr. Hickam's going to like this balance. We've had this discussion earlier. Um, during my rotation, we looked at four things, sitting static, sitting dynamic, um, standing static, standing dynamic, and it was two things, either in, intact or impaired. In hindsight, I would have probably done a Berg, a timed up and go. We could, there are many things we could have done bedside with this patient. We could have even descriptively said, um, in standing he uses one hand to steady himself, something of that nature, um, but this is what we have, so this is what we're going with. Some objective findings for bed mobility and transfers for almost everything he was, in fact, everything he was meniscus times one. Um, supine to sit, transferring to the chair, sit to stand and back down again, he was meniscus. For ambulation, um, he ambulated the first time 12 feet with a rolling walker with contact guard. Um, but he required a lot of verbal cues for safety and he ambulated with an IV at that point. He had no complaints of pain, and again, I'm seeing him the first day of surgery, he's on morphine, but I'm assuming that there was pain, it's, it's just that he wasn't experiencing any. Um, he was very motivated to work with physical therapy, and he, um, except for the fact that he initially, we brought in a rolling walker, and he did not want to use a rolling walker because when you're 33, you think rolling walker, elderly patient. So um, what we did was we, we agreed to bring him crutches for the next session if he would use a rolling walker with us during this session. Um, our justification for PT was that he had joint, impaired joint mobility, muscular weakness, impaired transferability, gait dysfunction, safety concerns, and pain. Even though he said he was not experiencing pain, I just assumed that when the morphine wore off, he'd be experiencing pain and we established that his rehabilitation potential was good. Um, so our short-term goals for him were to ambulate 300 feet, and this is basically so that he can return home, ambulate 300 feet with crutches independently while maintaining his toe-touch weight-bearing status to prepare for discharge and to perform functional transfers independently and ascend and descend 12 steps with supervision so he could go back into his house. Um, the long-term goals were for him to return to his previous level of function before this particular hospitalization. And his, his, his goal and um, the goal of his family was to return home as soon as possible. And I think that was to avoid any kind of complications due to infection. So the treatment plan for physical therapy was for seven days twice a day at bedside for gait training, um, and therax to the right lower extremity. Um, we worked on day one is, was part of the examination um, where we did ambulate him. Day two was where we worked on transfers, sit to stand independently, and um, gait balance training where he ambulated 150 feet. We trained him on crutches with contact guard assist. Um, he did do the stairs with the crutches. He, he did very well. He actually ascended. We used 10 steps at the hospital because that's what one flight of stairs is. 
Um, also at that point we knew he probably wasn't returning home. He was going home with his mom who lived in a, in a ranch style home. So for discharge planning for this patient, we wanted him to return home in approximately three days. That would be the usual stay. And the patient was discharged um, to his mother's home, as I said, on day two of therapy with an order for home health. Um, because this patient is younger and in better physical condition than most patients with hip fracture surgery, um, he's a great candidate to go home sooner than most. However, um, the goal for him was to get home as soon as possible because of his immunocompromised condition. Um, so this, <coughs> as far as the cultural and age-related issues go, I've kind of hit on them already. The patient was able to be discharged sooner because he has a strong family support locally. Um, and despite his comorbidities, he's young, strong, motivated. And one of the things I noticed when I um, evaluated him was that he was in very good physical condition. He had great muscle tone. You could tell he was a person who took care of himself, worked out, um, regardless of his, his other medical problems. So <clears throat> the prognosis for this patient is good. Um, I talked to my clinical instructor um, probably last semester, I believe, who um, told me that he had been in physical therapy for two months. I don't know how long he was in home health versus outpatient. But for a total of two months, he had fully recovered and returned to work and ambulates um, in the community without an assistive device. Um, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Leininger, Dr. Wagner, my CI Dana Grizenda, and Megan Andrejic for helping me complete this project. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? I don't know. Hello. <laughs> I actually have an orthopedic type question for you. Okay. So, regarding the ORIF, you evaluated him bedside. I'm wondering how you tested his strength, especially at the hip. And if there were any precautions, later you mentioned toe touch weight bearing, but if there were any other precautions related to the surgery that were important to follow while exercising and treating him as a PT. Um, as far as, we did a manual muscle test um, to check his strength. At the surgical site? Not at the surgical site. You had to sip at four out of five. Well, we did check. So you did resist where he had surgery? We, we resisted the, uh, down at the knee. Okay. You know what I mean? So I do know what you we mean. did. I'm just a little concerned. She didn't want to defer that at the hip at the same day of surgery? Um, we didn't go crazy, but because he was his status of having no pain, we checked it briefly and still a little concerned. The pain was kind of masked by the drugs, right? Absolutely, definitely. And there's new instrumentation um, and wound and I mean, we weren't checking through the range of motion. We basically would check in sitting, you know, let yeah. Is it Was resisting. it common practice to test strength around a surgical site there? It's just a little concern. Mm -hmm. Not usually, but in, okay. in many patients we did just roughly and deferred. A lot of times we deferred secondary too. Yeah, I, I, Many times active range I, active range I have no, no problem with. I'm just a little concerned with resistance across the cervical site. Um, we just let him basically lift his leg and then applied a little bit of pressure, but he... I, Don't I, think the surgeon would have liked that very much. He, <laughs> he was incredibly strong. I was very surprised. Well, the toe touch weight bearing status is for the to protect the hip. So obviously, I mean, you're not going to crank on this person, but the toe touch weight bearing is so that the, surg the surgical site can, heal, the bone can start to heal together. And it you doesn't slide on. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we, it, it is what we did, and it is what we documented. So, yes. <laughs>
Any other questions? Thank you.